How Phil Lanzen got into Uriah Heep and a little story about Mick Box, the big man on campus in that band. Phil Lanzen's our guest, the keyboardist for Uriah Heep. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. Mick Box is always the guy that a lot of people want to talk to when it comes to Uriah Heep because he's the man, he's been there since the beginning. And even though Phil Lanzen has only been there since 85, he's entrenched in a big part of that band. We talk about what led him to play keyboards for Uriah Heep. So Mick Box uh, called you when you were in Tasmania to join the band? Mm -hmm, that's right, back in 85 or 86, I can't remember now. <laughs> it must be 86. But, but for instance, now, did you know him before that? Yeah, I think we'd met a couple of times in Water Street in London um, I think it was some friends of his and I was with friends of mine um, but we never actually got into any conversation at that point uh, he knew about me and I knew about him and, and that's how it was for a while until such a, a time when you know things changed in the band and then I was called in uh, going into Raging Silence uh, what was your feeling uh, personally for you uh, how did you feel going into that? Were you nervous? Were you excited? All of the above? No, 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 no. I don't think I've ever been nervous about anything in my life. Well, maybe I should have been. But no, um, it was more an excitement and adrenaline. Uh, and also, <clears throat> um, you know, a new band for me and an excite a band with a history. You know, all, all these things matter that, 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 that you haven't got to sort of struggle at the, uh, at the low end of everything and have to work yourself up. Um, it was an exciting time for me, and I enjoyed music, and it's been great fun. Tell me about when, when you left home, I'm just kind of curious, what were the albums when you left and you said, Mom and Dad, I'm leaving home, what were the albums in your collection at that time? Well, back, Oh, good God, what are you talking, you're talking late 60s here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, gosh, I had a mixture, I had a mixture of uh, a lot of soul music and a lot of pop music. I, quite, I was quite into pop music and soul music, I was into a little bit of Jimmy Smith's not jazz, but that style of blues. Really, that was the start of it all. It moved on from there and became a little progressive. I was into Yes and Genesis and Gentle Giant, a band called Gentle Giant. And really, that was the, the core of my prog learning back then. So I mixed, I kind of mixed my head. I mixed prog with rock with pop and a little smattering of bluesy jazz. And I guess that's me with a little bit of classical thrown on top. Yeah, well, the classical thing, I was, I was just talking to Steve Hackett a few days ago and Uli John Roth, and they were telling me about their love and how there's misconceptions with rockers and proggers that some, they don't know why th that group don't understand that a lot of us like classical music back then. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, because uh, there was a, the love of classical and rock was seen as two separate things, and no one had actually dared to mix them together properly. Although John Lord, he had a good old go at trying it. Um, but um, the, uh, I think the keyboard players like Emerson and Genesis, and yes, those, those guys, big classical, I think we've got to hand it to them. They did actually push it through. And it, I, th I think we're thankful to them for having done so back in those days. When you wrote the, your, the latest book, your, your, the one for teens, yeah. what was the impetus for that? Like, like it's, it's been in the go for years, man. It's, it's just an idea I had many, many years ago. And I, the drafts are endless. I had wrote so many different drafts. I changed it. I jumped and changed it. I did everything. But the core of it was, while I was writing an early draft, I was listening to Bach's B minor mass. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's a piece of... Um, it's a piece of religious work, uh, but Johann Sebastian wrote. And it was in the background while I was writing the story. And because his music is so full of different melodies intertwining, I imagined that each melody had a color and could be seen. And this idea intrigued me for years. And I wondered, well, what does it all mean? What can you do with it? And so I, I amalgamated that thought into music that could be seen. Hmm. And each strand of music would have a color and be formed into something. And I, the thing I decided it to be formed into was a passion flower, because it has all the strands in the flower and it could easily be adapted to be something in, with 3D animation could become something special. And that was in my head. And I wrote the story around that idea that that thing could become a weapon and destroy all the shit in the world. And that was it. <laughs> You have an amazing brain. It's all I have to <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> More from Phil Lanzen, who's a very prolific guy. Links to his website where you'll see his paintings, his latest album, which is called 48 Seconds. There's another one called If You Think I'm Crazy, which has an amazing album cover. It's an amazing album in general. 
and he's also an author. Incredibly prolific guy. I'm just in awe of what he can do. There'll be links to his website in the description of this video. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. Buy a t-shirt, help support our channel. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Stream Music. Mm -hmm.